Monday of the month from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, I'm so excited uh, for our lecture tonight on Can We Decolonize Time? Thinking about Settlement, Justice, and Indigenous Oral History with Professor Jill Stoffer. I'm actually going to invite up my colleague Amy Gerla, uh, who knows uh, Jill better than I, to do a fuller introduction. Um, and just as a reminder, we do have friends uh, watching the live stream from home. And so in respect to those friends um, and in respect uh, to our speaker tonight, if folks could please uh, put your cell phones on silent or turn them off uh, for the duration. I first took a class, uh, my, it was my freshman year of college, and I thought I knew things about peace, justice, and human rights, but when I, and so I thought maybe I don't need to take this course, um, but found it to be the most compelling um, possible subject that I took in college. I knew instantly I wanted to um, concentrate and Peace, Justice, and Human Rights, which is what Professor Jill Stopper has brought to Haverford, um, creating the, uh, the program of the concentration of Peace, Justice, and Human Rights. Um, I still remember that first day we did, um, everyone did a kind of thorough introduction of each other, which was a great way to build relationships and in classroom um, cohesion, and also kind of a metaphor for what work we are all engaging in these days of building communities and working together. So, um, Jill Stoffer is an associate professor and director of the Concentration of Peace, Justice, and Human Rights at Haverford College, which is just around the corner <laughs> from Pendle Hill. Uh, her book, Ethical Loneliness, The Injustice of Not Being Heard, on the, is on the role of that social abandonment plays in discourses of transition, reconciliation, and recovery. It was published by Columbia University Press in 2015. A recent published work includes articles on drones, settler colonialism, indigenous land claims, and how international law judges child soldiers. She is currently working on a book on the relationship of time to law and justice. Um, and another personal note, I brought up um, in my email, I was asked to um, respond to your consideration for <coughs> tenure and promotion as associate professor in Harvard's interdisciplinary program in peace, justice, and human rights. So I found what I'd written, and I mentioned um, the work that I did that uh, you had me do over the summer that was around um, truth and reconciliation commissions which uh, was my first introduction to um, that whole world of transitional justice and thinking about healing in, in broad um, terms and was so relevant to the weekend conference where we had uh, presentations around um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Maine that looked at uh, child welfare practices for Wabanaki people. So it feels like everything's coming full circle. It is. Uh, a complete joy to have you here, and I'm very much looking forward to all that you have to share. Thank you. All right. I guess I don't need two of those. All right. Here, put it over here. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> At least not yet. All right. Um, thanks so much uh, to Amy for that really nice introduction, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Is this working? Is it loud enough? Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna talk tonight about some ideas about time and their relation to historic and continuing injustice imposed on indigenous groups in North America. To do that, I'm gonna talk a bit about an interesting case from Canada in which indigenous groups used oral history to claim title for their lands. Um, so in the course of the argument, you'll hear some words that sound unfamiliar, but I think part of the point is that they are unfamiliar, so you can just allow them to be unfamiliar. So let's start with some background. 
In recent years, courts in Canada and to a certain extent in the U.S. have begun to accept or the oral histories of indigenous groups as evidence in court cases rather than dismissing them as hearsay. Let's make clear what that means. Uh, hearsay, from a legal standpoint, um, is has a lot of exceptions, but in general, if someone testifies that someone else said something, um, that gets called hearsay rather than being admitted as evidence. The reason for that is that, um, so for if, I, if I say Marie told me that, that she saw Howard there, it's different from when I say I saw Howard there because Marie is not um, on the stand right now and can't be cross-examined, so it's a, re it's a reporting that doesn't quite carry the same weight. Um, so, since oral histories are passed to the people who testify to them from a third party, they might count as hearsay if we didn't think about the larger picture. The larger picture is that for many indigenous groups, oral tradition is the means of storing cultural information, rules, geographies, spiritual practices, and histories. So these stories ought to count as evidence because for the cultures in question, they function similar to how legal documents function for our Western legalistic culture. This small step, admitting oral history as evidence rather than excluding it as hearsay, already involves a discourse about time. From the standpoint of a liberal progressive view of history's unfolding, admitting oral history as evidence seems like a step forward where law expands to be more inclusive and responsive. But a closer, review, a closer view reveals that those making judgments in these cases are rarely able to hear what's being said by indigenous persons telling oral histories in court settings. The worldview, language structure, conception of time passing, ideas about geography, culture, spirituality, and community may differ so radically from those of the dominant culture that Unless judges presiding over settler colonial courts learn enough about what oral histories aim to do and how they do it, they will impose legal injustice. This creates a situation where settler colonial subjects, and that's a term that I'm using to refer to anyone who is, relatively speaking, a late arrival on this continent, um, a situation where settler colonial subjects may feel good about product progress, which is one way of thinking about time passing, while indigenous groups and their allies may recognize that this is a continuation of, er of a very old plot of assimilation and extermination, which is a different story about time passing. So the aim of the talk is going to be to look at how settlement gets lived as an unquestioned reality by white settlers, and how different accounts of temporality and of storytelling might open that reality to questioning and possible transformation. And I'll present the argument in nine short sections. The first section is called Delgamook v. British Columbia. Delgamook v. British Columbia is the legal name for the case brought by the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en peoples claiming title for their traditional lands in what is currently called British Columbia, Canada. A key piece of information in this case is that these lands were never relinquished by treaty. Delgamook is the name of one Gitsan hereditary chief, but the suit was brought by 50 chiefs of various houses and clans of the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en peoples. In bringing suit, they sought recognition for what of, of what for them is an established truth that the lands in question have always been and still are theirs. The case inhabits a zone where law passes judgment on the passing of time and in doing that, enacts one temporality rather than another without acknowledging that it has the power to do that. In his opening statement, Delgamook asserted, quote, we do not seek a decision as to whether our system will continue or not. It will continue, end of quote. This declaration asserts sovereignty, but it also voices a view about time. My sense is that your typical judge or settler colonial subject can hear the assertion of sovereignty, but not the assertion about time. And that's probably because it's easier to see indigenous land claims as claims about justice than it is to see them as claims about time, in part because most settler subjects are too confident that they know what time is and that it's only one thing. I'm gonna explore what's wrong with that confidence today because I think it opens up some new possibilities for interrupting settled thoughts about, uh, of settler colonial subjects um, about what it means to be settled. I'm pursuing this line of thought because I think it's an urgent, urgently needed practice of justice. So it's one thing for courts to make rulings and truth commissions to, echo, to issue recommendations. 
It's another thing entirely for an entrenched worldview to shift such that what was once viewed as an unquestionable structure of the world is experienced by people who benefit from that structure as an inexcusable form of domination. What I mean is, what would it take for settler colonial subjects to see, to really see, hear, and feel their implication in ongoing injustice? I'll assert my belief that institutions cannot accomplish this on their own. And that's why I want to spend a bit of time thinking about interruptive moments. Section two is called settler colonial subjects. And what I want to do in that is just kind of clarify what I mean when I say settler colonial subjects. Settler colonialism is a name for a form of continuing colonization of lands where settlers arrive in order to stay. And so they aim to displace and possibly also destroy the inhabitants who were there before them. It differs from the kind of colonization that arrives with the intent to exploit people and natural resources, but does not seek permanent settlement and therefore may not intend to eliminate the people dwelling in the now colonized space. This distinction can be blurry, however, because exploitation can also destroy persons and groups, and not all settlers wish to eliminate, in, eliminate uh, indigenous life. But the distinction helps clarify some things that are at stake when we discuss both indigenous political demands and continuing life in settler colonial territories. It may help us see that there are deep structures of thought dedicated to making indigenous life invisible, consigning it to a past, or assimilating it to the settler's worldview. And it makes clear that these, set, that these structures of thought not only harm indigenous per persons and groups, but insulate settlers from their own implication in ongoing injustice, rendering it difficult for settlers to see that their way of life is an outcome of many of their own choices rather than a given, rather than something that couldn't be otherwise. So put otherwise, settler colonial subjects residing in Western democracies may think that their political systems are fair, just, and equal. And they may think that in such a way that they do not consider the background conditions of those systems, including the violence that overturned other systems and sought to eliminate other ways of living and thinking. And often, even if they do acknowledge past injustices, they don't see that the injustice continues in the present moment kept in place by how settlers live in settler colonial societies right now. In short, because they do not consider that things could be otherwise, they do not realize that they are at least in part responsible for how they are. Section three is called common sense or perceptual tradition. So a moment ago, I suggested that cases like Delgamook inhabit a zone where law passes judgment on the passing of time and puts in place one temporality rather than another without acknowledging that it has the power to do that. We might call this temporal privilege. If citizens of land that was taken from an earlier inhabitants do not feel implicated in an ongoing injustice, how does that denial become possible and what makes it able to continue in widespread fashion? Such privilege is part of a perceptual tradition by which I mean an accustomed way of seeing and interpreting built up over time by the way people live together, what they value, what they look at, and what they don't see. Mark Rifkin calls this settler common sense, by which he means the way that non-native settler colonial subjects rely on framings of the world that normalize settlement as the background truth against which experience of the world is interpreted and in doing so, they render other possible framings of time and justice illegible. Of course, we all rely on some already established facts and procedures in our daily dealing with each other so that we can focus on what's pressing and challenging rather than having to reinvent every wheel. That sometimes means that we forget to notice that much of what we accept as given is not really given, but rather is stipulated and then adhered to over time in largely unthought ways. In our daily lives, common sense presents many of our choices to us as if it were, that were simply how the world works, and so we don't always notice that these are choices and that things could be otherwise. Another part of the problem resides in how settler colonial histories get told as a progressive realization of an inevitable expansion of territory, obscuring other possible tellings. We might call this a lapse by which I mean a failure of memory or a piece of a larger picture gone missing. When a story of settlers settling on land is told as preordained or unproblematically legitimate, there's a lot that has to remain outside that frame. 
Here's an example set in the 19th century US but connected to the present moment by a continuous thread. Lapse occurs when the 1862 Dakota War is described by settlers as criminal behavior by natives rather than as sovereign self-defense in the face of longstanding injustice. Settler common sense perceives native self-determination as a temporal aberration, as if challenging white settlement were a refusal to live in the present moment or a failure to recognize a future assumed by settlers as inevitable. Settlers think this way at least in part because nothing in their perceptual tradition allows them to see the decades long slow motion onslaught of injustice and deprivation that leads to the Dakota War. The official colonial story of native acquiescence and disappearance supports the received idea that inevitable national expansion is simply what time is rather than one accounting of time's passage. The same story would look different told from the standpoint of the Dakota who neither acquiesced nor disappeared in any simple way and whose longstanding relationship to and stewardship of the land would give voice to a different experience. My point is really that we've all learned how to see, where to look, and what to think about what we see when we look. And that training rules out certain ways of thinking. So here's a more, ver a more recent version of a lapse. The protests at Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline were largely framed by the media as an issue for law enforcement. That is a kind of settler common sense. After all, the protest is not only about water, but about the sovereign right of the Sioux to control developments that impact their land and livelihood. And multiple treaties support the claim that the land in question belongs to the Sioux. Calling what happened at Standing Rock policing attempts to evacuate native tribes of their sovereignty by assuming that the conflict consists of criminality and law enforcement rather than an insistence on self-determination. What would we see instead if we interrupted the perceptual tradition of settler colonial subjects and looked at the hashtag no DAPL movement as a form of continued self-assertion by Native Americans and then we saw the state's response to it as a continued repression of that self-assertion. So what I'm doing here is questioning whether what settler colonial subjects take to be settled is actually settled. And that is also a question about time. Section four is called lapse. So a lapse is a failure of memory or a piece of a larger picture gone missing. It's important to mark what's negative about a lapse. Settler colonial ways of perceiving and inhabiting worlds fail to acknowledge, to remember, to appreciate, and to honor as equal indigenous lives and indigenous ways of world building. That's an ethical failure with deadly consequences. It's also important to notice what might be positive about a lapse. A lapse, when identified, stands as evidence that no system is universal. It points to something missing from a commonly accepted picture. No regime, no perceptual tradition encompasses all truth. And so the unintelligibility of some ways of thinking may have positive value, pointing toward resources and modes of resistance that, are, that already exist or that are struggling to come into being. Change can emerge from sites like this. Precisely because any way of thinking is the result of training and not a reflection of an unchangeable nature, subjects trained to think inside one system can learn to listen for what that system cannot contain. So lapse is not only negation, but has a positive value. If you're wondering where you might find lapse in your daily life, just look at the person next to you. Other human beings are just that, other. And thus, no matter how much common sense we may all share, every human being will retain the possibility to surprise, to defy expectation, to resist, to disappoint, to enrage, to inspire love and admiration, and, and so on. There is something about any other person that no amount of your thinking about them will ever fully encompass. That is also lapse as something other than negation. So this lack of transparency in our relations with other people is not only invisibility and silence, but opportunity, a site where something unexpected can come into view. So you might learn something from admitting that you'll know, never know everything about another person. So, speaking of dominant framings, what is the lapse that allows settler citizens to consider themselves unproblematically free on land that is legitimately theirs? And what might productively interrupt that certainty? Legitimate ownership of land in this context is granted by law, 
but that law is built on a deep history of theft and injustice. Learning to see that may help people think differently about what it means to dwell together with others on land, or teach us to admit that land's provenance cannot be entirely determined by property law, just as time's passing cannot be contained in one temporal rendering without showing signs of a lapse. Section five is called oral tradition as evidence. <clears throat> For both Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en peoples, tradition is stored in oral narrative and material culture. By, by tradition, I mean a broad range of rules, history, spirituality, geography, and cultural norms and aspirations, all of which may not be separable in the same way that they may be separable in North American settler colonial traditions. The Gitsan oral histories are called Adawak, and the Wet'suwet'en are called Kungak. A website for the Gitsan, Gitsan people describes the Adawak this way. Quote, each wilp or house has an adawic or, or, or oral history which describes important events in its existence. The carvings on the totem pole record part of a wilp's adawic. The adawic is tied to the territory and events depicted by crests on totem poles signify jurisdiction over a particular territory by a wilp and its hereditary chief, end of quote. So an adawic serves to record house ownership of land and resources a pole serves as a material sign of these responsibilities, and performing these histories at feasts is what the legal philosopher Robert Cover would call juris generative. It creates law. In court, the oral narratives were used as evidence that the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en houses ought to be granted sovereignty over or title to their land. Whereas in the lives of these indigenous peoples, the oral histories are title or there's something close to this Western concept of title that we're, that we're talking about. So that a story or a poll or a song could be legal title should have been an interruptive moment. It and many other moments of disjunction like it should have stopped everyone in their tracks and sent them scrambling to understand how this universe of meaning builds worlds differently than does Western legalism. Indigenous oral traditions do not conform to legalist expectations about evidence, and they don't reward settler assumptions about how narrative works, especially legal narrative. The stories lack set beginnings and endings and change according to the setting and purpose in a given situation, and they implicate the listener as much as the teller. Julie Cruikshank writes that oral history, and here I'll quote her, survives not by being frozen on the printed page, but by repeated retellings. Each narrative contains more than one message. The listener is part of the storytelling event too, and a good listener is expected to bring different life experiences to the story each time he or she hears it, and to learn different things from it at each hearing. Rather than trying to spell out everything one needs to know, it compels the listener to think about ordinary experience in new ways." End of quote. Stories told in this way implicate those meant to hear them in the ongoing work of world building. Lee Miracle writes about how oral and written storytelling fun functions for Coast Salish people, another indigenous group in British Columbia. She calls the process collective and collaborative, not in the sense that everybody has to agree, but that many participate. Oral tradition, or even a written story that aims not only to deliver set rules, but to provoke in the hearer a duty to interpret how to live, guides its subjects to build worlds and implants responsibilities. It is juris generative, it creates law. Or as Miracle puts it, quote, story becomes a means of intervention, preventing humans from retraversing dangerous and dehumanizing paths, end of quote. That might be one of the aims of settler colonial law as well, but what animates its practices differs and the difference matters. So the stories don't conform to legal, legalist conceptions about evidence or settler colonial assumptions about how narrative works. However, on my reading, it should be clear to anyone who truly listens, and I'll talk about more of this in a second, that these stories ex exist in order to bring into being and then sustain a world, much like Western law does for many settler colonial citizens. But it's important to note that these stories inhabit both time and language differently and aim to build a different kind of world. Learning to hear them is one way that settler colonial narratives might get interrupted. Section six is called A Goat Story. <coughs> uh, 
excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold, so I'm trying not to hack at you. Thank you. An adawic is normally performed for persons who accept its authority, understand where it comes from and what it aims to do, and honor it for its role in their lives. In Delgamuk v. British Columbia, portions of a few different adawics were performed in court for a very different audience in order to provide historical evidence for continuous ownership of land, des describe Gitson's social structure, and meet the organized society test prescribed by Canadian law. A woman named Gwans, also known as Mrs. Olive Ryan, was a wing chief of the Gitsugukla House of Hanamuk, and Hanamuk is both the name of the house and of the house's hereditary chief. In court, Gwans shared part of an Adawic dealing with a historical event. The point of the story on my reading is to teach listeners to attend to their relationships with the non-human world and to treat animals and land with respect. But note that my drive to find its main point goes against the spirit of the form. Guan's reports <clears throat> that young boys were treating some goats badly, mocking them, and even throwing small ones on fires. One boy felt bad about this and protected a small goat. Later, goats who had made themselves look like human beings build a village and invite Guan's ancestors from an ancient village, <clears throat> an ancient village called Tamlak Amit, to a pole raising feast. Then the secretly goat people gather the visiting villagers into what looks like a community hall, and the building collapses during the feast and kills everyone except the, the boy who had saved the small goat. The goat who had been treated well helps the boy who treated him well, whose name is Aunt Golulbik, back down the mountain, and the boy returns to Tamlak Amit to tell everyone. As Guans puts it, quote, they don't allow us to make fun of these little creatures. That's why they said to the young people not to make fun of animals, because the creator will get mad at you if you mistreat them. That's what grandmother said. The creators will laugh at everything. The man and girls and boys that's, that they've created, they created in this world." End of quote. So in the Adawic, the people of the village make sure their children know how to treat animals with respect, and the one-horned mountain goat becomes the crest of the Aunt Golulbik house. In this event, uh, after this event, everyone moves from Tamlak Amit to Gitsagukla, where they have lived ever since. So this story establishes a long tradition of the house feast, makes points about deeply held beliefs about the human relationship to and respect for nature, and demonstrates control over one portion of land and reasons for, move to another, for a move to another site. <coughs> Sorry. Section seven is called A Bear Problem. Also in court, the current Aunt Gulubich, Mrs. Mary Johnson, told a story about another Adawic um, based in Tamlak Amit about a very large bear with great powers that causes a landslide that kills all the warriors who try to combat it. The bear seems to have been angered by some women who were playing around with trout bones and taking more from nature than they needed. And, the, and thus the bear was provoked to attack the village and destroy it. This story also functions as a way to warn against treating nature with disrespect so it expresses cultural rules and norms and it establishes a history of dwelling in specific areas of land, and it therefore functions as a form of title, and offers reasons for a move from one site to another site. Now, you can see why settler colonial subjects immersed in a perceptual tradition that takes settlement to be an unquestionable fact of the world may doubt that all of this is true in the same way that Western legal truths are true. But that misses the point. Adawics exist as documents of longstanding relationship to land. Read alongside other historical sources, they should be enough to support the claim that the Gitsan are an organized society with, deep, with a deep historical relationship to the lands they claim. Heard as a complete system, it proves legal occupation over time. One might need to take some time to learn how to hear these claims as legal claims, but it can be done. So sure, lawyers trained in the legalist tradition might seek to show that the narrative forms of oral tradition when taken apart and subjected to the legal standards of an alien culture, begin to fall apart. But how, in turn, might the earth-destroying and genocidal forms of colonial capitalist legalism begin to fall apart if subjected to the logic of a more respectful and sustainable relationship between human beings, animals, and the earth? A key question here is, who gets to decide which story makes more sense? And now I'll get to what we've called, what I've called, the bear problem. 
After presenting all the adawic based evidence, the lawyer for the plaintiffs asserts that the adawics are told in court for the truth of their contents. The judge interrupts with this question, quote, well, do you advance Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson's evidence about the destruction of the village by a supernatural bear as proof of that fact, end of quote. The lawyer insists, quote, it's, it's clear from the evidence you've heard that the spirit world, the animal world, and the human world and many aspects of history are interrelated, end of quote. It does not seem to be clear to the judge that this is so, and the judge complains, quote, I don't have any trouble with the proposition that the, that the Adawic or the oral history of the various houses is admissible. My problem is to define what is the Adawic, and that's the difficulty I'm having. I've heard evidence of what I would describe, and I don't say this pejoratively, but the closest thing that comes to my mind is mythology, and if the witness says it's part of the, of the Adawic, am I bound by that? End of quote. The judge can't imagine being bound by what he calls mythology, and we can, we can understand that given what his training is. But a more generous reader might recognize it as a different cultural expression of history, law, and social norm making. At the same time, the judge never questions the conditions of production of the history, law, and social norm making over which he presides. And if he did question it, he might come to see that modern law is as much of a mythology as is the story of the powerful bear that he can't make himself hear. So here's a question. How might we dislodge the certainty of someone entrenched in a settler understanding of law and procedure, such that a story about a powerful bear or goats who make themselves look like humans could be heard as world-building accounts corresponding to legal title to land? Section eight is called logic. This leads us back to the lapse with which we began. I said that a lapse is negative. It's a piece of time or a different temporality missing from an account smoothed over to look seamless. But lapse also has a positive resonance. It points to something missing if we learn to look for it. If we will find lapse in any account of settler colonial history that frames territorial expansion as always inevitable or requires that indigenous truths have to reside in a timeless past or dictates the terms of citizenship or of tribal membership for, for, for indigenous peoples, or educates indigenous children in residential schools, or attaches self-determination to Western legal ideas about sovereignty and land ownership, and so on. Lapse is a feature of settler colonial truth. We might like to think that failures of communication reside with the speaker, and thus any failure means that she who speaks ought to learn to do better. But when we know more about perceptual traditions and the forms common sense may take, it becomes clear that sometimes no space is made for hearing, and so the fault may lie with the one who thought she was listening, or the fault may lie with the way human beings adhere unthinkingly to structures where certain types of speech may not be heard. A colonial court declaring that it has jurisdiction to decide whether indigenous groups have jurisdiction over their own lands is one such faulty space. So let me make a point about what we're calling reasoning or logic. That a system is a totality and yet has an outside may appear to logic as a problem. What I mean is you could ask the question, how can something be total and yet not include something? How can indigenous groups have sovereignty if they're part of a North American sovereign? But those questions only pose a problem if you stay within the system that claims that it is a totality. What if your aim instead is to show that no system succeeds fully in being a totality, that there's always outside, there's always something more? If that's your aim, then the objection that it defies logic to find a surplus to a totality does not make sense. So a philosopher or a lawyer might say to me, you can't expect me to accept an argument that defies logic. But I might respond, why do you assume that there's only one logic operating here? The philosopher's objection is similar to the idea that we can't make dependable legal judgments based on forms of evidence that feel unfamiliar. It assumes that jurisdiction, by which I mean what counts as law and who gets to judge, is already settled rather than being the very thing it issued. As I pointed out early, earlier, calling something settled is always also a way of making a point about time. So to relate this back to the problem of settler common sense, you might say, this is how we have always done things, and I might be skeptical of the truth value of your statement, 
even if you can show me valid evidence supporting your position, not because I don't believe in facts, but because I'm aware of how the colonial frame limits what many of the words mean in the phrase, this is how we have always done things. My sense of what logic dictates and how words work has been interrupted by a competing temporality. That's interruption as a practice of justice. So let me say the same thing differently. Yes, it does push beyond the edges of Western legal, le legal reasoning to include a bear with unusual powers and goats who make themselves look like humans in a description of territorial ownership, lineage, and reasons for a move. But what does a citizen of the United States or Canada have to say when asked to describe why she has any right to live in the land where she lives? If I've accomplished anything today, I hope it includes showing that if we look at the big picture, property law on its own cannot offer a satisfactory answer to this question. And learning to hear how indigenous groups, what they say, learning, learning to hear the stories that indigenous groups tell is one way to interrupt that interpretive inheritance, the perceptual tradition that makes us think that colonial settlement is settled. And now my final uh, section is called time. I've been saying that multiple temporalities are at play when we subject indigenous worlds to colonial rules, but I haven't been very specific about what that means. One way to think about this is in the form of a question. What would it mean to call a, a history of law that retrospectively authorizes theft and lawless, lawlessness for some at the expense of others a shared history? What exactly is the history that settler colonial subject, subjects share with indi indigenous groups whose lands were taken? Mark Rifkin observes that, quote, for things to be simultaneous, they must be situated within a single frame of reference, end of quote. If that's true, does native dispossession really happen in the same time as settler claims to property? Do defenses of water and self-determination really happen in the same time as policing operations that criminalize peaceful protest? Do, lawsuit, do, do lawsuits sinking, seeking indigenous jurisdiction over territory never ceded really happen in the same time as settler colonial court rulings that have every confidence that it is within their jurisdiction to decide? I've tried to show that a structure of lapse for those who learn to look for it may produce subjects who encounter unintelligibility and see in it a sign that more work needs to be done, that something other than what is expected is here, and that we may need resources that are not readily available from within accustomed frames in order to understand it. Knowing how to recognize that our own traditions have not prepared us to interpret the ways of other traditions opens up different possibilities for navigating time in its shared and unshared dimensions. And that potentially opens up vast possibilities for decolonizing thought and time. So here's just one possibility. If we think about linear progressive time, the idea that things happen in an order, on only one order, if we think about that not as the only truth about time, but instead as a structural presupposition located in a particular temporal frame, then what it means to inherit a past changes. Let me say that complicated thing in more simple terms. We could teach ourselves that linear progressive time is not the only form time takes, but instead is just one way of expressing human time. And if we did that, we might be able to rethink what it means to inherit the past that we have inherited. For instance, the fact that the past cannot be undone doesn't prove that time is linear. Rather, our belief that time is only linear narrows for us what we think can be done about the past. That matters because at every moment in the long story of relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples, including this moment, different narratives and outcomes were and are possible. Every tradition is a set of beliefs and practices underway, held in place by structures of habit, rule, and tradition. Shifting something that seems to be settled will never be easy, but there is hope here because if our systems of meaning are not unchanging essences, but rather are the result of interpretive processes that are always underway, then they can always be interrupted because anything that is underway can be interrupted. That's it. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.
Oh yeah, the other. Thank you so much again, Jill. Uh, questions? I would be happy to pass the mic. Um, mine is a comment that you might comment on rather than sure. a direct question. But I guess, <coughs> excuse me, I would. Uh, okay, my, um, I would hold to the theory that um, oral history is maintained much more accurately among preliterate peoples. That once we get writing to fall back on, it is not as accurate or as precise as it would have been before. I don't know if that's been studied or documented or not, but I think that that speaks to the value of oral history. And then, as one who studied the Bible, uh, we're dealing with oral history, something that's been passed on for perhaps centuries. Uh, and uh, we think it's pretty good. The, the judge might think it's pretty good. Uh, but uh, you know, the idea of a land claim based on Jacob having a dream uh, doesn't seem any more far-fetched than the bear. Um, mm -hmm. That's uh, where I'm coming from. Yeah. I invite any comment. Well, I'm not sure I agree that oral history gets loses its accuracy once writing appears. Um, you know, all of the indigenous groups that I'm talking about are literate. And yet, certain ways of recording meaning traditionally are stored in these stories. And the stories are passed down. People are trained in how to, how to tell and remember them. Certain people are allowed to tell certain stories and certain people are not, and everyone understands what the rules are. A lot of care is put into what it means to inherit a tradition and store memory in that way. There are arguments within the communities about whether recording it in writing is a good idea or not, because writing changes it. It changes it into a form that you could uh, refer to as authoritative in a different way than, than the authoritativeness that it bears as a living thing. Um, and as I mentioned when I was um, quoting Julie Cruikshank, that part of its um, power is that it's a living thing that you can learn different things from in different contexts. There's this tendency in Western societies to think of a text as something that speaks for itself. Um, that anyone with access to it knows what it is because it says the same thing to everyone. But all you have to do is be a college professor to know that those texts do not say the same thing to everyone. And that's why I tell my, my students, you know, you have to explain why this quotation says what you think it does. Already within the written text we find that, that context might, might vary. So uh, I guess, you know, my, my, main, my main claim would be to push back on the idea that um, oral history somehow degrades once literacy enters the picture. If it degrades, it's usually not because of literacy, but because of domination, where people lose their stories for reasons other than literacy. Thanks. But the point about the Bible is well taken. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hi, please bear with me. I'm starting on May 20, oh, starting on May 26, 1838, I, large group of Native Americans were kicked out of North Carolina and forced to leave the U.S. entirely to some place called Oklahoma. And my question is, that did happen. I don't see any way of undoing that. But what can we do about that now? How can we make things better? How can we make things right? There not, may not be an answer to that, but I would believe that they have an indigenous right to live in the Cherokee area that they were living at for thousands of years. But my question is, like, the, this judge has to decide, say the oil company now has pumping oil where the native people live, you know, what, what do you do about that? So I, I don't know what, there may not be that there is an answer or there's an easy answer. But my question is, how can we like correct things if we see a wrong? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, once a lot of time has intervened, these questions get really complicated. That's what you're pointing to. Um, because a lot of people will have raised families, built things, bought things, you know, built lives in the land in the meantime where it feels like their ancestral land. And it's not clear that, um, that you, solve a, you solve the problem by displacing other people, right? So there's two things I would say. One is that learning to think differently about whether property law can easily answer the question mm -hmm. 
would be a good step forward in terms of learning how to actually think meaningfully about it as a problem that we have inherited that we ought to learn how to think about justly rather than ignoring. The other thing is that um, we might want to take, instead of always jumping to, and what should we do, we might want to take the time to be able to tarry with, you know, this is a, something I'm taking from um, my friend who's an African-American philosopher named George Yancey, where instead of jumping to, well, how can I fix this problem as a white person, le learning how I am this problem as a white person, yeah. right? So this, this, and his point is that the jump to want to fix it right away is part of the problem because it stops you from looking at what your own practices are and w how you might actually be able to learn how to think about them in a way that's m that could get at what's so deeply structurally rooted about these problems that makes them so difficult to solve. So that doesn't really answer your question, but as you admit it, it's a really difficult question. There were about 70 people for four days in this room for the last four days um, dealing with a lot of these challenges. And none of us came out the same as when we came here. There was um, a shifting paradigm for each of us. And I think that the major shift, there are many of them, but when, when everybody introduced themselves, They claimed their settler identity. I'm a settler here on Lenny Lenape land, our host. When we start thinking like that, um, the lamentation for what we have participated in in the theft of land comes and we grieve and we start to understand in a different way. It's one simple thing that we were doing and I never did that before. And many people in the room, we all stood in a circle and made commitments about what we were going to change in our lives when we left here. And um, many folks were going to put plaques at their meeting houses saying this meeting house is a settler on the land of whatever native tribe owned that land. So we did a lot of listening and a lot of loving each other and respecting each other as friends. And, you know, a lot of people here, the, the native people, some of them had never been among Quakers before and thought, you know, we were pretty interesting. And um, so I, I, I feel like I've been dunked into a baptismal water of newness, having heard and participated in and listened to the intense heartbreak of how people have lived because of the theft, and I'm part Native American, so I was, you know, a foot in each world. Um, but, you know, and then also introducing myself as I'm Sharon, daughter of Verl, who is daughter of Hazel, who is daughter of Twyla. You know, taking that lineage to where it really goes, the paradigm shifts, and I think, you know, we have Facebook now, so Nancy and I, who were here the whole weekend, um, we're reading lots. I was reading one of the p presenters' poetry all day today to get under into her stories of her family. I'm, I feel new again, and I think making the commitment and having the courage to go and do that, I mean, and really caring about it, is a way we can start to change. And it's not an easy road, you know, but we... Um, we were asked to do prophetic lamentation, a season of prophetic lamentation. That's a, that's a big deal, and um, I'm committed to doing it, and 
see if my Quaker meeting is, and maybe if our quarterly meeting is, and on and on. Um, so I really am happy that Pendle Hill is holding this um, space in sacredness that we can do this, what you're saying and what they've been saying this week. So thank you for putting so many things into a different frame of time, which makes really good sense to me, but it's not going to make good sense to the head of Exxon or somebody else. So I don't have a question. I was commenting, but thank you for framing it in a completely different way than we framed this weekend. So Thanks. it adds to the the rich stew that we've had. I'm glad it was helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me go to Paul and come back to you. Uh, this may go back somewhat more even to the first speaker and also things that you were saying in terms of talking about biblical interpretation and the fact that we are all Quakers here. Quakers are not particularly legalistic in certain ways, particularly biblically. We, and what I want to really have asked you to focus on, how might this relate to the possibility of our continuing revelation that is very basic to us? We are not taking on authority the past. So Fran and I are war tax resistors, for example, because there's no authority that says we have to pay to kill people. It just doesn't exist. Now, or if someone joins the military, they can become an apply for conscientious objection. Well, didn't you know that? We asked if you were a CO when you joined. That's one of the things on the four-page contract. But no, you can see things not in a legalistic, strict way. Because you mentioned the nice thing about not writing it down is in fact that it is a living testimony or testament. And there's actually something nice about that. So I don't know if in just saying that, you can relate this in some ways to having the strength of a flexibility as opposed to a rather rigid legal system. Yeah, um, so I should say I'm not a Quaker. I teach at Haverford, which is a, a Quaker institution. But um, so, so I don't have the expertise to comment on, on what Quaker practice would be. But from what you say, what I hear is it echoes one, a couple of the points that I made that I don't think institutions can get this job done on their own, that it really comes from a shift in the way a large number of people think about what their responsibilities are and how they act on them and what it means to reside with others on land and uh, you know, be fair, be just to others. Um, so in that way, um, I'm not waiting for law to solve the problem. I'm interested in the ways in which law approaches it, especially in Canada, because Canada has a, a constitutional clause that says that indigenous groups have rights that weren't granted by Canada, which opens up a bunch of really interesting possibilities. But I'm always careful to say that law is not going to solve the problem on its own. And one of the problems, I think, with contemporary North American society is the confidence that law is going to solve social problems. It will never do that on its own. So I guess we're in agreement, at least on that. Oh, there's, there's also a great problem of translation. Yes. And I think that when you start looking at the stories or legends of the people, uh, the legalistic um, approach would draw from that based upon archaeology and anthropology. That if there's an avalanche and a story within the tradition, where is the avalanche? You know, the physical ge geography. That was an exhibit and, in the court. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's sort of, this is a source of truth, but then there's an acceptable truth in terms of, you know, the archaeology and anthropology. It doesn't replace the stories or the legends, but that's much more accessible to the Western legal mind. Um, second, that when you're talking about land and occupancy, you're basically talking about adverse possession. That regardless of whether it was by contract, 
or treaty or assembly that they held the land during this period of time. And that that's what you're going trying to get to when you're, you're talking about their occupation of land. And that interpreting the language is really at the time of the treaty. Just like in interpreting the American Constitution, it's what was the understanding of the meaning of the words in 1790 as a starting point to the interpretation. Now granted, certain judges don't seem to want to go beyond that, but certainly that's a starting point. And the, you start with the notion of property law, but I think you really want to go back to the total notion of what's called the reception of law. And that that is essentially that certain lands were discovered and that that's then certain brought the body of law from the other country over. And that if uh, land was by conquest, then the law from the home country didn't come over. And unfortunately, we see that application of that principle of law down in Guantanamo, as well as many other places. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that really kind of precedes the whole definition of property law that you're talking about. Yeah, so um, basically what you've done is um, shown how it would be easier to think about this if we put it into a frame that's already a Western academic or legal frame. So that if we call it archaeology or anthropology, it'll be more persuasive. Or if we, uh, or if we understand it according to existing structures, it'll, it'll work better. But I kind of don't want to do that. I'm pressing against that, even though I, rec even though I recognize that your point is that it might work better. I don't want to do that. Um, the th uh, but an, uh, one thing I'll say about um, the point about treaties is that the interesting, th interesting thing about this particular case, and I just kind of glanced over it really quickly, is that no treaty was ever signed. These, lines have, these la lands have never been ceded. They have been there since, depending on who you ask, for hundreds of years or since time immemorial. And they're still having to make a, ca a, a court case in a settler colonial court to prove that. No treaty was ever entered into. The lands were never lost. That is a really interesting situation to find yourself in, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before I pass, I know, the, yeah, but the, the, before I pass the mic to Lena, I, I would say, you know, in my country, I am from the Dominican Republic. We have a cartoon, bear with me here, that said, it portrays Cristobal Columbus and a few indigenous, and one indigenous is telling the other, he said that his name is Columbus and that he came to discover us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I really um, resonate and I'm curious about um, the limitations you are naming to addressing these paradigm shifts through legal frameworks, and that legal frameworks can only take things so far. And I'm sort of curious, um, I grew up going to public school, and so the f for m public school in a military town, a very traditional kind of uh, curriculum. Um, and I was really struck by uh, the limits of interventions when at, in your 20s, you know, you can, you can, unlearning behavior is, is, is really critical um, and, and sometimes difficult. And so I, I was curious if you had examples um, from your own experience or that you know of, of interventions sort of outside the legal framework that are helping to shift these paradigms, um, perhaps inter interrupting streams of other paradigms going forward that we have such good systems for. Well, I think a lot, um, a number of indigenous cultures are um, emphasizing the word resurgence now, which is to kind of link back up with languages that are in danger of being lost and thereby regaining understanding of cultural forms. Um, you know, for the, for the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en, um, keeping the Adawak and the Kungak and the various songs going. Um, participating in the ongoing governance of the ways of world building. Um, and perhaps 
not spending as much effort trying to prove to the colonial state that they ought to exist, um, that's a choice to be made. In term, but I think what you're asking is, what does a white person do, right? Um, and I think, I think that the answer to that is, you know, right. quite broad. But one thing that I often say when I'm teaching um, an, eth an ethics class to students is that there's all kinds of ways in which you might like to do something really huge to change the world, but you can make a huge difference just in how you treat the people in your life and what your attitudes are and what you will and will not stand for and what you'll say when someone says something that is objectionable for racist or um, other reasons. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways in which um, change begins with you and then it radiates outward. And sometimes that ends up being small, but sometimes it ends up being surprisingly large when enough people do it. Because if you think about the history of ideas, all kinds of things have changed in huge ways. And it wasn't just ideas that made it happen. Often violence was involved in well, as well, unfortunately. But you know, uh, another thing I often say when I teach human rights is that there was, there was a time when people thought you were born in a certain station in life and there was no way out because you were placed there by God or history. And most people don't think that anymore. How did that happen? People thought differently, you know? Um, so that's, I guess, as close to an idealist um, pep talk as I can get. Yeah. <laughs> and coming on that? Yeah. Um, so one example of uh, something that Esther, who I worked with in um, the Penobscot Indian Island was where she lived, um, she would say um, what's now referred to as Maine or what we now yeah. call Maine to kind of, yeah, refer to it hasn't always been Maine and our notions of statehood are. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's, I did say uh, what, is, what is currently known as British Columbia, yes. Canada when I started <laughs> for that reason. I learned not to trust Western logic because I'm a regional planner and I've been involved in several Lenape land claims. And they have a, a written history in a way which is called the Wali Olam or the Red Sticks, which are really like a memory prompt that you see. And a lot of it sounds like the Bible with a great flood and a serpent and all of this the kind of thing. But according to that, which was transcribed <clears throat> by a Mennonite minister in the 1830s, so there again is the problem of translation, um, is that they originated in Europe and spent a great deal of time in Greenland and Upper Canada and came around through the Great Lakes to where they are now. Only in the last two years has archaeology and <clears throat> anthropology and DNA proved that their story is right. And yet for 150 years it's been poo-pooed. So uh, it taught me not to, to pay attention to Western, shall I say, verification. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it is interesting, that drive to verify, isn't it? It's a similar thing with what, um, there's a school of thought that's called TEK, uh, Traditional Ecological Knowledges, which basically takes what, uh, the ways that indigenous groups have been managing land for a very long time and then shows that science finds that this is a good thing to do, even though all kinds of experience could also show that. However, the good thing about it is it, it is being taken seriously in ways that, are, that go beyond the verification part, so pros and cons. When I was a little girl, my mother used to threaten me that if I didn't behave, she was going to send me back to the Indians. And um, she even made up Indian words when we were driving, and that's a sun, and she would make up words. So there was this Indian focused thing in this Irish Catholic crazy family. So I became an ex Catholic after reading Thomas Paine when I was 17. And um, I always loved the parts of the church that were ceremony and, you know, all that st stuff. And so I had a chance to apprentice with a Native American medicine man from the Ojibwe tribe. It just felt like coming home. And so for 14 years, I worked with him and other Native teachers and gradually adopted in my value system and my way of looking at things a more indigenous view of things, particularly when it comes to the environment and life in general. And as I grew more deeply into it, I became 
more detached from mainstream culture, which I still am to some degree. However, you were talking about not writing and how um, it's best to keep the oral tradition through the people trained to be the storytellers. I found an opportunity to use this experience when I began teaching creative writing in prisons. And when you think about it, people in prison are not mainstream people. And 90% of the blacks on the East Coast have Native American roots. And through the years, and a lot of mm, banning by the, by the officials, I saw a shift in what the prisoners were thinking about because I had given them other ways of thinking. And so I became a, a conduit for their voices by publishing books through sage writers. And it was the beginning of the, I guess, incarceration literary movement. And so without the, that publication, without those public listen to what's really going on here, nothing would have changed. But, you know, in some prisons they're now doing... The, the thing that most thrills me about all of this path is that out of Sage Writers grew a homework assignment I gave, which was observe your fellow prisoners and staff, and if you see them doing something kind, I had a bunch of thank you notes, and I said, just write them a note and say thank you for your kindness. And I didn't know if they would do it or not. I thought they might not. Uh, I had two classes, a women's and a men's. And when I got there the next week, the guards in the schoolhouse were all female. And they came up to me, and they were hugging me and saying, oh, Miss Judith, what have you done? A nanosecond of kindness had penetrated this awful, awful, horrible environment. And I was telling a group of lifers about it, and they said, that, there's never any kindness in here. So they helped to design kindness cards as an alternative to violence and uh, raised the money for the first publication. We give it, gave out over 100,000. It spread globally. We now have people pausing at noon, setting our devices to remind us at noon to pause and take five clearing breaths and think a kind thought. So that has evolved into this whole Kindness Beyond Bars program and more recently, the Department of Corrections wants to take over the project. So this is how I, with my experience of understanding the duality of the two worlds that I'm living in, actually it's more than two, I think, um, how to make it work for people who are not indigenous, but certainly are thrown away people who really not part of this whole culture and uh, the legal thing. We won't even start with that. But, uh, and I also, in my counseling practice at one point, was working with a couple of people who had grown up in the Canadian orphanages and had been sexually abused in that process. And finally, in Pennsylvania, we're starting to look at that. So this stuff comes up slowly, but it gets drowned out by fake news. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for that wonderful um, presentation. I, so I, I, there's a, uh, two parts to the question I have. The first has to do with a case that uh, I learned about recently uh, in Hawaii, in which, uh, which you may well already know about, uh, in which Mark Zuckerberg uh, moved to Hawaii and um, attempted to build a big mansion on, on, on the island, and uh, in order to do so, uh, essentially sued hundreds of native Hawaiians uh, through a process called quiet title claims, in which um, essentially uh, they would be forced to um, put up the, their land to, uh, to an auction, which where it would be sold to the highest bidder, which would of course be him. Um, and uh, now those uh, those lands were held under uh, what was what was known as the Kuleana Act, um, and the the issue I, th I believe, as I understand it, that came to court um, was 
uh, that uh, the uh, the tradition of passing those lands down from person to person through the generations uh, was largely an, an oral one and one that was you know taken down through uh, through the generations through through. Uh, through families, but wasn't written down, wasn't, you know, kept, there were no records kept of these, um, uh, of these holdings, even though they'd been uh, held by families for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, now, I don't understand, I don't know all of the details of this, of this case, um, but uh, I, as I understand it, Mark Zuckerberg uh, eventually withdrew his, his claim um, because, uh, <clears throat> well, partially because those claims were backed up by some legislation, and partially because this story exploded, it came, you know, came out, and people were outraged. Um, so, I suppose the, the first part of my question is simply: I, I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that particular case as it pertains to um, the the many aspects of the, the talk you just gave and your research. Um, and the the second part would be the. <laughs> having to do with the irony of the fact that I learned about this story and it was spread in many ways through Facebook, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, so my, my question there is, um, you know, Facebook is w or seems to be one manifestation of a, a vast and rapid transformation that has over, you know, spread across the planet. Um, and one of, if, if not the, the most incredibly powerful um, aspects of that transformation is in the way, uh, the ways in which we tell stories and the ways in which we relate to one another um, the w and the ways in which the stories we tell are now uh, connecting, colliding with one another, changing um, both through the, the mediums in which they're communicated and um, the, uh, in, in some cases, the content and the, and the contexts in which they're being told. Um, so, the, sorry, this is, a, I, I realize I'm rambling, but I'm, I'm getting to a point, I promise. The, the question I have for you is, how do you think we might um, navigate and sort of open up into the unique moment in which we find ourselves, um, in, in, in which, um, in a way in which we can um, harness the, the <laughs> transformations on you know that are happening on this planet, in such a way that we can uh, interrupt, disrupt the destructive, negative, um, calcified stories that have so harmed the world, and um, generate uh, both generate new ones and and uh, reclaim uh, and and re um, what was the what was the word. Um, Revitalize and you know um, expand the 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 reach of ancient stories into into culture in a way that that can perhaps be healing. Um, <laughs> sorry for very long. It's okay. Um, I'm uh, not thank gonna, you. I'm not going to comment on the Zuckerberg case because I don't really have anything interesting to say about it. But. Um, in terms of you know how we learn to hear a wide array of stories, there's lots of ways to do that. You can seek out literature written by people who are indigenous or from any any other culture than your own, and read those stories and and um, under begin to try to understand how they build worlds differently. But even something like um, indigenous Twitter, right? There are a lot of indigenous people on Twitter, and you can learn a lot. Of, um, and not only that, but you'll get book recommendations from that, you know? Um, so I myself am not a big fan of Twitter. I don't feel like much can get done there. And yet, uh, there are moments when it does actually allow certain types of um, world building to happen, I have to admit. Um, Facebook probably as well. I mean, these are all um, places where people are kind of curating their own experience of it, which has its limits. You might just be creating your own little echo chamber, but you can actually also curate it in a way that interrupts the echo chamber by seeking out um, those voices of people that you might not normally listen to. Um, 
But yeah, you know, I do think that um, a really good way to begin to learn how to understand another frame of reference that, you know, different from the one you've inherited is to read literature from outside of that inherited frame. So, and there's a lot of really good literature to, to do that with, so it gets it also enjoyable. Thank you. I've been thinking a lot about what you said about the temporality uh, and the differences in temporality. And we usually present history as uh, our understanding of history as settler colonialists, as, um, as progressive and linear and along a timeline. Is there a way to tell the story of a larger history that includes a different temporality in a form that's not a timeline? And how would we do that? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question because in order to answer it, I'm going to have to speak in a linear fashion, right? Exactly. So there's a way in which we're held to that logic to a certain extent. And yet if you back up from that and you think about your own history, like how in your life things happened in the past, but what they mean to you varies over time. And some of what those past things mean to you vary over time because of your own life experiences but some of them actually vary over time because of how the world treats you. So let's say that you know, someone um, enacted a harm on you, make, leave that totally abstract, um, and then on top of that, they wouldn't listen to you talk about it. How you inhabit that past is different from if someone had harmed you and then justice was offered and people said that should never have happened. We're all involved in dealing with how people inherit harms. And one of the ways we're involved is whether we'll, whether we'll actually hear what happened and do justice or whether we'll ignore it. And that's a way in which um, his, you know, history is not necessarily linear because what the past means can be changed by what we do in the present moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a philosopher. <laughs> Uh, unless there are other questions or the final questions. That's probably a good way to wrap it up. Though. Yeah, that was, I mean, that, that was, that was beautiful. It's almost a mic drop. You'd have to take it out of the stand and yeah. put it on the ground. But also, I don't believe in damaging people's equipment. So <laughs> just symbolic, symbolic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Professor Stauffer. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would be remiss, I realized um, th when I came down and was checking our table of flyers that we were out of our flyers for our next lecture, which is actually next Monday with Dr. Hal Weaver, who's joined us tonight, uh, Hal. Um, uh, Hal will be sharing uh, next Monday here in the barn, um, the 14th, that's correct, from 7.30 to 9 p.m., uh, the topic uh, is Black Fire, an African-American Quaker seeker activist in a white supremacist nation. Um, Hal, yeah. <laughs> um, Hal will be sharing some experiences and insights um, from his memoirs in progress. Uh, he's joined us at Pendle Hill as he's working on his amazing memoirs. Um, so it should be an incredibly rich evening and really encourage everyone uh, to come back next Monday from 7.30 to 9 p.m. here um, as just, just a, t a taste. And please do grab flyers to share uh, in your networks before you leave tonight. Um, we'll follow Hal's journey from his earliest days on a small black college campus in Savannah, Georgia, through Westtown and Haverford. Um, and then from his early experience in communist Moscow as, an, as a member of an official USSR USA young adult exchange group. Um, he's traveled the world breaking down barriers and building bridges between cultures, often using film as the medium through, as the, medium through the Black Film Project and the China-Africa-Russia Project. Um, he's a pioneer in Africana Studies, founded and chaired the Africana Studies Department at Rutgers, um, is now associate at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for Africana, uh, African and African-American Research. Excuse me. So it should be an incredibly rich 
uh, evening uh, next Monday, the 14th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. There are flyers uh, that look like this on the table. Uh, please take them and please share. Um, and thank you for coming out uh, for our lecture tonight. Mm -hmm.